Hey guys, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Thanks for tuning in to today's video here. We're gonna be talking about stomach acid, hydrochloric acid, HCL for short. Why can't I tolerate hydrochloric acid? What does that mean? We'll dive into that and kind of look at the ins and outs and why your digestive system may not be able to tolerate that. Before we do, please smash that like button. It really helps the search algorithm. Put your comments down below. Let me know your experience using HCL and different digestive um, supports and your success with that. All right, let's dive in. So you have hydrochloric acid, right? You get it from betaine hydrochloride, HCL, HCI for short. You're going to get this from betaine, right? It's essentially trimethylglycine, another kind of amino acid type of compound, very acidic. A lot of times um, HCL is going to be contained with pepsin. So HCL is a couple things, right? It's made by the parietal cells in the stomach. These are the cells that also produce intrinsic factor to help bind up, to help bind B12 and help absorb it at the bottom of the intestinal tract. It also makes hydrochloric acid. So produces a whole bunch of hydrogen ions. It binds to chlorides in the intestinal juices and it makes hydrochloric acid. So you have proton pump inhibitor drugs like omniprazole, prilosec, nexium. These are proton pump inhibitors. So they take the protons. These protons are pos positive charged ions, i.e. hydrogen, and it inhibits them. It prevents them from being released in the stomach. Therefore, the hydrogen cannot bind to the chloride to essentially make hydrochloric acid. So Essentially, we need good gut function. People that have a lot of damage in their intestinal tract, they may not be able to make hydrochloric acid, whether it's a parietal cell, autoimmune, antibody issue, some kind of a pernicious anemia issue. It's all possible, right? So you need hydrochloric acid. The question is, if you have issues with acidity, why is it? Now, most people that have acidity problems, they can't tolerate much acid. It's because their gut lining is thinned out. We call it atrophic gastritis. The tissue is inflamed, and essentially the inflammation has thinned out that mucus barrier. The goblet cells in the intestinal tract or in the stomach produce mucus, and you have this protective barrier, and that's kind of thinned out. And now it's like having a sunburn. The analogy I tell my patients, any patients listening, they'll still sound familiar. If you have a nice sore back, right, and you need a nice massage or a nice adjustment by a chiropractor, but you have a sunburn, are you going to be able to enjoy that or really even be able to take that adjustment or – massage in. You're not going to be able to because the inflammation is so severe. So most people that have significant gastritis, inflammation of that tissue, they may not be able to receive that stomach acid, that hydrochloric acid. So what do you do? So that's the question. The first thing is you have to look at the root cause. You have to look at what's driving it. Now, a lot of times it could be poor stress. Stress activating the sympathetic nervous system shuts down the parasympathetic, the vagus nerve, and that's going to make it harder for you to make your hydrochloric acid, right? Hydrochloric acid activates proteolytic enzymes in the stomach called pepsin. That acidity then trickles down from the, small, uh, from the stomach into the small intestine where you start to make a whole bunch of bicarbonate to bring the acidity to a more neutral level around seven. Triggers the pancreas to make a whole bunch of lipase and proteolytic enzymes, fat and protein-based enzymes. Triggers the gallbladder, release a whole bunch of bile. So if we don't have good acidity, acidity then activates proteolytic enzymes in the stomach, activates lipolytic and proteolytic in the intestinal tract. That acidity also triggers cholecystokinin to go contract the gallbladder. Acidity also triggers bicarbonate. And the acidity is also antimicrobial. So good hydrochloric acid levels, nice low pH in the low, lowish twos is going to be very antimicrobial. It's like putting, it's like spraying some apple cider vinegar, which is acetic acid, on a pitta table or on you're using it as an antiseptic on your countertop. It's actually very antimicrobial. So if we have good acidic levels in the stomach, it makes it much harder for microbes to grow. Same with bile salts. Bile salts are slightly acidic, right? Bile acids for short, acid, slightly acidic, and that also has an antimicrobial effect. That's why you see women that do birth control pills and actually alkalizes the vaginal tract slightly, and that can cause increased yeast overgrowth. That's why the major side effect of birth control pills is yeast overgrowth in the vaginal area. So acidity, very important. The question is, can you tolerate it? So the first thing we're going to do is one, can you tolerate any level of acidity? So if you can't tolerate a hydrochloric acid with pepsin capsule, even like at hundred milligrams, then we may just try, we may even come in there like with a teaspoon or so of apple cider vinegar diluted in four ounces of water. That's acetic acid. Apple cider vinegar, ACV is acetic acid. You could also try citric acid, which would be lemon or lime juice. You could do a teaspoon of that. Mix, dilute it in like four ounces of water. But that's going to be very helpful. That's going to get your digestive juices going. A little bit of acidity is helpful. If that's too much of a problem, we could also do some bitters, whether it's um, some gentian. It could be ginger, orange peel, anise, peppermint. These are some nice bitters to stimulate digestive juices. So ideally, if we can kind of get a foothold in 
with a little bit of acid, then we can kind of climb up from there, right? If we can do a little bit of apple cider vinegar or a little bit of um, lemon juice or lime juice, that's our kind of foothold and we can climb up. If we can't do that, then we're going to work on some bitters. And if we can't do that, we're going to really be honing in on some good soothing gut support. We may also want to be doing the gut soothing support out of the gates. If I see someone complaining with a top five symptom of gastritis or intestinal pain, we're going to be adding in my GI Restore, which is going to have things like glycine or glutamine in that. Of course, collagen or collagen peptides or bone broth is very high in glycine. Also very good for the enterocytes. I'm going to add in things like DGL, deglycerized licorice, aloe, slippery elm, okra, uh, zinc. Zinc is very helpful. A lot of studies on zinc actually helping to improve gut permeability. So zinc can actually shut down some of the gut permeability, the leaky gut thing that's happening there, which can drive autoimmunity and more inflammation and more food allergies. Very helpful. So we'll add that GI Restore and we'll do it on an empty stomach once to twice a day. We may even really pre-digest our foods just so there's not as much roughage um, or debris that's kind of more hard scraping up against the intestinal tract. And also just low-hanging fruit, right? We cannot forget the diet and lifestyle components, just chewing your food up, right? Good adage, you have 32 teeth, so about 32 chews. Now, you don't have to get overly anal and count it, but about like an oatmeal-like consistency that you kind of feel like. And most people, once you kind of have the habit of that, you can kind of just set it on autopilot. You know, I had an issue kind of back in the day. I remember being in college. I would uh, have a, a bite of my food, and it would be like four or five bites. People around me would say, you, follow, you swallow your food in four or five bites. I'm like, wow. I never really thought about it. And then once you think about it, you never go back because you're always like, all right, how many twos did I get? But what you kind of do is you kind of get used to like the mouthfeel of what that food should feel like. And then that's kind of the trigger. You don't really have to count, but the counting and the mouthfeel should kind of be in sync around 30-ish um, chews. Now, what chewing does is increases surface area. More surface area, the more the enzymes and the acids can work. And obviously, the more they're broken down, they are, you know, the, the less hard the enzymes and the acids have to do their thing in regards to emulsifying and breaking them down. So we got to work on reducing gut inflammation and using nutrients, like I mentioned, in the GI Restore to help with that. We got to work on cutting out food allergens. We have to work on decreasing sympathetic nervous system tone when we're eating because that shuts off digestive juices, enzymes, acids. It shuts all the blood flow where? To the hands and feet because the sympathetic nervous system response is all about running and fighting and fleeing. And where does the blood have to go to? Where do the nutrition have to go to? The nutrition has to go to the muscle so that can happen. So it will shunt it away from your body. And then of course, just when that happens, you're right, you normally you get stressed, you get nauseous, and you don't even want to eat, right? Get in an argument with your kids or your spouse, and it's like, man, I'm not even hungry at all. All right. Same kind of thing happening. Parasympathetics dropping, sympathetics are going up. Now, first thing you can do is just create a quiet environment, right? And then you can just say a little prayer before you eat, focus you know, for five minutes on all the things that you have gratitude for. That activates the parasympathetic nervous system. Good nasal breathing to the nose, five seconds in, five seconds out. That gets the parasympathetics going. It's a great way to start your meal. And then, of course, we can add in some digestive enzymes. Um, if we're sensitive to any acidity, we may lean more on the enzymes because they tend to be less abrasive, less acidic. And again, people say like, oh, acid, is acid good or bad? Well, it depends where, right? We talked about a lot of spots where acid is very important. So it's all about where and about where does that plug into the physiology, right? We know acid is very important, very antimicrobial, very important for the intestinal tract, the stomach, that nice acidic chyme, all the food mixed up is really important. So the small intestine can trigger the pancreas and the gallbladder to do what it has to do. And then, of course, when food moves its way into the colon, it may it kind of gets more neutral again in the small intestine and then kind of gets maybe a tiny bit slightly acidic in the colon as, as electrolytes are absorbed in. So hope that helps out of the gate. So if you really want to understand why, get the stress under control, get the food out under control. Obviously, there could be H. pylori. H. pylori can definitely thin out the, the gut lining, thin out the mucus, inflame the intestinal tissue as the, the helix-shaped bacteria can basically screw its way right into the intestinal lining. It literally does. It's got a helix shape and it literally will just screw itself right into the intestinal lining, create inflammation, and it will lower your stomach acid. It does it through the production of the urease enzyme. The urease enzyme, it hits the urea me metabolite from protein and that spits off CO2 and that spits off ammonia. Now, ammonia has got a pH of 11, so we will start to raise up the pH and the CO2 is what you're going to measure on an H. pylori breath test. They'll give you some urea to swallow, right? Because if the urea is, if higher levels of urea is there, and then you have more urease, then you're going to get a lot more CO2 
positive breath test a la H. pylori breath test. Of course, we want to do like a, a GI map or a really good comprehensive genetic stool test to pick things up. We're going to look deeper at that. We're going to make food changes. We're going to make lifestyle changes. We're going to look at the adrenals, people that have chronically thin gut lining. Usually there's this ebb and flow of chronically high cortisol, and now it may even be low. It may be an HPA access depletion, not like an Addison's issue, but just total HPA access chronic stress issue. And so that chronic high to low level of cortisol, it could be low now, that can really thin out the gut lining with that chronic sympathetic stress that's happening. So hope that makes sense. Um, I'll put a little list below here of some of the products that I mentioned today, the GI Restore. Uh, I'll put the links for the hydrochloric acid, the enzymes, and the bile salts that I use in my clinical practice with patients. And then, of course, some of the things that you guys can use at home would be like the apple cider vinegar, some of the lemon or lime juice, and even things like some of the ginger, some of the bitters. You can make a nice little tea of that and do that before a meal as well. So hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, if you want to reach out to myself and or my staff and colleagues, put a link down below so you guys can reach out, put a link for products. Feel free, if you enjoy this information, give it a share with friends or family. I appreciate it. Let me dive into some questions, guys. I'm going to skip questions that aren't super relevant to the video unless we have time. What would cause vomiting yellow fluid in the morning? So if you're vomiting in the morning, I mean, are we talking like someone that has morning sickness, like a female morning sickness? That's going to be the high levels of HCG can really induce a lot of uh, nausea. Now, things that can help that are ginger and bitters. Also good gallbladder support, maybe some bile support, maybe some dandelion tea, things that really help support gallbladder flow, maybe some phosphatidylcholine. If you're waking up and you're chronically stressed, maybe you have this big cortisol spike in the morning, adaptogens, uh, magnesium, calming nutrients, those things are going to be really good. You could do a magnesium foot bath. Um, you could try to meditate. You could do a nice shower and with a, a nice cold shower at the end. Hopefully that helps. Could be a, a gut bug too, because remember I mentioned H. pylori earlier. You could also have maybe a parasitic infection. You could have a little bit of SIBO, bacterial imbalance, that's off in the intestinal tract and the stomach. You could see that you, on an organic acid test potentially. You don't know the exact location. Uh, on a stomach, you look more like a glucose breath test. That would tell you the very top of the intestinal tract. Stool test, if we see bacterial imbalances, I mean, obviously, you're, you're testing the stool as it moves its way through. So you don't, know the, you don't know the exact location, but if you address that bacteria, you're going to eventually have it address the stomach as well. Okay, very good. If you take one tablespoon, I'll show it to you. If you take one tablespoon of apple cider vinegar with a glass of water and your stomach burns and you feel nauseous, could that be a sign of gastritis? Well, definitely can be. It's also a sign that your gut lining is super thin and you need to work on all of the soothing things that I mentioned earlier, like all the things in the GI Restore to calm and soothe that. And then I would really make sure your diet's spot on. You're chewing your food up well. You're not overhydrating with food. We want to keep our water away from food. I mean, a couple of ounces to swallow pills is not a big deal. I'm talking about like hydration. Hydration should be 10 minutes, 15 minutes before, hour and a half, two hours after. So definitely means that there's some gastritis more than likely. I mean, if you have no symptoms at all during the day and that's the only symptom, it definitely tells me you're right on the threshold of, of having symptoms. Okay, good. If you eat a decent diet, paleo, low carbon, feel pretty good after, but bowel movements are slow and sludgy. Does that mean you need more HCL enzymes or bile salts? Depends. If it's like more streak mark, clay colored, blonde stools, a lot of wipes or a lot of um, marks on the toilet seat, that could mean low bile. And so we would always just give more enzymes because a lot of good enzymes will have lipase in it, which helps with fat. And we also may add some bile support in. And then, of course, you can add more HCL because HCL is an important trigger for the gallbladder, right? That good acidity as it moves from the stomach to the small intestine, it triggers cholecystokinin to really contract that gallbladder. So you really want to hit it 360. You don't want to just do one thing. Of course, if you have telltale um bile or fat issues, stools are floating, those kind of things, you definitely can lean on the on the bile support, gallbladder support first, and then lean in everything else after. No questions. Okay, Dr. J, how do I protect myself against pasturella? Apparently, it's carried by pets such as dogs. I'm not really sure about that. I don't really know enough about that one to comment. Um, but it just depends. I mean, how's, how's the dog catching these different things? Like, what's the mechanism of it, right? Is it like uh, ticks, like they get it from going outside, or is it something natural that they, I mean, even an indoor dog would get? Not really sure. Um, yeah, so it's a skin and soft tissue infection following an animal bite and a scratch, right? And so it would be something that you would get from like a, um, a cat scratch 
or a dog scratch, probably more of a cat scratch. I actually had a um, Bartonella, Bartonella hensile, right? Cat scratch fever. When I say it, I hear the Ted Nugent song in, in the back of my head. Um, but with that one, I used um, a couple of herbs. I used some berberines, I used some silver, and I used one other herb that was very powerful. So you can do it. If not, they typically will treat it with like NTZ, nitazoxanai typically. Thank you so much for the feedback on the excellent teachings. Thank you so much. Best testing to find out if I have H. pylori. So, I mean, I would do a stool test out of the gates. I mean, you can always test via the blood, IgG, IgM, IgA. You can also look at it via the breath. But just because one of those tests negative doesn't mean, or test positive or negative, so probably negative. One of them tests negative, you could still have it. So I would always want to come back with the with the stool because the stool will actually look at the exact level you have. Because there's a lot of um, tests where it'll only tell you if it's positive, they see it in the antigen. But on the genetic ones, we can see the threshold, right? The threshold on the genetics is 1,000 cells. 1,000 cells they find, they call that positive. But what if it's 500 cells, right? So it's nice to know how many cells you're dealing with and you can go in there and attack it. So dealing with silent GERD and heal stomach ulcers. How long after healed stomach ulcers uh, should you start HCL, no H. pylori? So it, it depends. If you feel good and there's no issues at all, just start with the smallest amount of acid, like an eighth of a teaspoon of ACV or lemon juice, and then just kind of work your way up. And as long as you don't feel it and you can get up to one tablespoon or more, then you can move to the um, HCL. I have no problem with that. Just take it in the middle of the meal so there's food already coating your intestinal tract. That way it doesn't lean up against raw mucosa. Now, silent reflex is essentially where the reflux is, is hitting the vocal cords, but you don't really feel, you don't have that acid reflux kind of feeling, but they may come in there and see it on a scope. I think that's really the big the big thing there. They call it uh, laryngeopharynx reflex. Let's see if I can give you a little bit more insight on that. So with silent reflex, usually just a bitter taste, chronic cough, difficulty swallowing, hoarseness, post-nasal drip. Um, you do have a little bit of sore or burning in the back, right? So there is that little bit of possibility. That's the LPR, laryngeopharyn reflex. And that's where the stomach travels up the esophagus. And so how it differs, how it differentiates between acid reflux, it tends to irritate the larynx a little bit more. It tends to be the bigger thing. And of course, I think acid reflux, people kind of have that puke reflux up and they kind of know that because they can taste it and it's quite clear where LPR, laryngeo pharynx reflux, sometimes follow under the under the radar, so to speak. But with laryngeo pharynx reflux, silent reflux, a lot of times FODMAPs and bacterial overgrowth can be a big issue there. Now, when you're dealing with acids, a lot of times you need these acids. You do. The question is, can you tolerate them? Because if you don't break down the food, the food rots and creates its own acidity, and that can create irritation in the stomach. But if you come in there with good acids of your own, you can break that food down, emulsify it, or, or at least kind of uh, break it down into its constituents, and then move it along the intestinal tract with less problems, right? And plus, acidity is an important trigger for that esophageal sphincter to close. And so ideally, you want your body to have good acidity to break it down and not have the acid production of that food essentially rotting in your intestinal tract. All right, guys, I think I mentioned all the major issues here. Is there anything else here? Um, with silent reflex, would you so use soothing herbs like you mentioned to help? Yeah, I would be doing all the same things. I would test out HCL. I mean, the only reason I wouldn't test HCL out is if I have active ulcers. Then I would really work on all of the soothing stuff. And if you're going to test it, just start at the lowest possible level and then gradually work your way up because usually the irritation is going to be dose dependent. So you start at the lowest possible dose with some kind of an ACV or lemon juice and taper your way up. You're going to know in that first quarter to one teaspoon if there's a problem or not. You're going to know because you've tapered it up. And so most people don't necessarily have to start with an HCL. They can start with a you know, fraction of an ACV or lemon juice type of dosage. But when in doubt, start with enzymes, start with soothing nutrients like my GI Restore, and then you can work on some of the gentle acidity in the liquid form. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, give me a thumbs up. I try to keep it real. Again, this is clinical knowledge. I've been doing this for over 10 years full time, 60 patients a week, 5,000 patients in my career. So um, this isn't theoretical. This is in the trenches, like real applications with patients. So I hope you enjoy it. Comments down below, share with family or friends. And if you need help or support, I am here for you in your corner. Uh, worldwide with uh, telemedicine, functional medicine support worldwide via Skype or FaceTime or phone. So we're here for y'all. You guys have a phenomenal day. Take care, y'all. Bye now.